Hi, Mark Donovan here. And today I'm gonna to go over an issue that affects a lot of students uh, during a check ride. Uh, one of the biggest questions that students get stumped on on a check ride is, what are they gonna do if there's a piece of equipment or an instrument not working in the aircraft? And there's actually quite a involved process that involves more than regurgitating a tomato flames or flaps in order to assess whether or not uh, an aircraft is airworthy to fly uh, for um, that particular check ride that day and just in general. So I'm going to go over um, some material on what a student should do or a pilot in command, I should say, um, for dealing with something in the aircraft that isn't working and determining whether or not they can fly uh, the aircraft for that day. So stay tuned. To the mountain, the All right, let's get into this. How to assess if you can fly with an interoperative piece of equipment or instrument. So how to deal with interoperative aircraft equipment? Well, one of the most missed questions on a check ride is how an applicant would deal with an interoperative instrument or piece of equipment on their aircraft. 14 Code of Federal Regulations 91.213 specifically deals with interoperative instruments and equipment. Check ride applicants should thoroughly review and understand 91.213 as they can be assured the designated pilot examiner will ask them one or more questions on this topic, and it will be scenario based. Uh, so when presented with an inoperative equipment situation, a pilot in command or a student candidate going for the check ride should reference several items before determining if they can fly the aircraft and that it is indeed airworthy. So this flow chart really walks you through the whole process uh, of assessing whether or not you can fly the aircraft with some piece of inoperative equipment or instrument. So we'll start in the top left corner. And I'll just put my uh, cursor on here to... Something's not working in your aircraft. Well, first of all, you wanna know, does the aircraft have a MEL or minimum equipment list? If it does, follow the MEL's guidance. Um, it'll specify any corrective actions and it'll basically determine if whether or not you can fly. But be, keep in mind that MELs are specific um, to the tail number and specific to the owner of that aircraft at that time. Um, if you aren't sure if you don't have one, most likely you don't. They're very difficult to get, uh, particularly for single engine piston aircraft. Um, so let's assume you don't have an MEL. Okay, next question you ask you going off to the right, is it required by the type certificate of the aircraft? So you need to look at the type certificate data sheet, the CAR 3 or the FAR Part 23 regulations. If it's required, yes, it's a no-go, you're not flying. All right, let's say it's a no. Nothing precludes it in this first box to prevent you from flying. Is it required by the KOL, KOEL, or Kinds of Operation Equipment List, Section 2, uh, limited limitation section of the Airplane Flying Manual or the Pilot Operating Handbook? Well, many older aircraft don't have a KOEL in it. So if you don't have a KOEL listed in the POH or AFM, uh, then you're gonna move forward. Uh, but if the KOL does exist for the aircraft and the KOL specifically says that you need this particular piece of equipment that's not working, then you're not going to fly. Stepping further down, is it required by the comprehensive equipment list in Section 6 of the Weight and Balance section of the Airplane Flying Manual or the Pilot Operating Handbook? If it is, well, you're not flying. If it isn't, then you can go to that tried and trusted set of acronyms, A Tomato Flames, Flaps, or grab card if it's um, if it's an instrument flying. So you're gonna look particularly at FAR 91.205, 91.207, or 91.209 to assess whether or not uh, you can fly with this piece of non-working equipment or instrument. If it says you must have it, then you're not flying. Next, we need to look at the airworthiness directives associated with that aircraft and see if there's any airworthiness directives that specifically require that piece of equipment working. If it does, again, you're not gonna fly. Um, if there's no airworthiness directive for that piece of equipment, then you can go forward and say, can we have it removed or deactivated and placarded? If you can go ahead and do that, uh, then you're gonna move forward. If not, you're gonna say, no go, we're not flying. So once you've, let's say, determined there's nothing precluding you from flying the aircraft and you've properly placarded it and disabled it, and that's a key part here, deactivate or disabled it, um, you can then assess finally, hey, is it safe to you still to fly? 
If you still personally think it's a pilot command, it's not safe to fly, it's a no-go, you're not flying. Um, if you assess that it is safe to fly based on this process, you can go fly. So this is the whole sequence you should go through when you have a piece of equipment not working, and particularly in a check ride, if you're asked by the examiner, something's not working, he or she's going to want to see if you kind of go through this process. So I just want to talk a little bit more about minimum equipment list. Uh, so inoperative instruments equipment, again, by 91.213, they spell it out. Um, but um, there is some relief uh, from 91.205 in regards to the use of an approved MEL if one exists. But again, most of the time, we're not going to have an MEL associated with a single piston aircraft. And again, an MEL basically authorizes a person or owner of the aircraft uh, through a letter of authorization from a, like a FISDO that says, yes, this aircraft can operate under certain types of operation uh, with certain things not functioning on it. Um, the LOA and the MEL are non-transferable as part of the sale uh, of an aircraft to a new owner. Uh, the MEL is specific uh, to a particular tail number. And anything that's spelled out in that MEL, again, it's only related to that tail number for that particular owner of the aircraft. Uh, the FAA-approved MEL includes only those equipment items that the FAA finds may in be inoperative while still maintaining an acceptable level of safety by appropriate conditions and limitations. Kinds of operation equipment list. Uh, again, uh, there's a circular advisor, circular AC 91-67 that kind of goes into the KOEL. And again, 91.213 is your main regulation that you look at on how to handle inoperative instruments or equipment. Um, and, and again, 91.213 spells how, how you can get some relief from the requirements in 91.205. Uh, so the, again, the KOEL is a list of equipment installed in aircraft that specifies for which kinds of operations a piece of equipment is required. It's used as part of the process for determining if an aircraft with inoperative equipment is airworthy. Typically published by the aircraft manufacturer as part of the limitation section of the airplane flying manual or pilot operating handbook. So unlike an MEL, the KOEL is associated with the make and model um, um, of the aircraft and listed in the POH. So example, KOEL may state that a particular backup instrument or equipment must be working to fly under day IFR, IFR or night IFR, but is not required for day VFR or night VFR. For example, a standby battery may not be required to operate for day VFR flight. So let's just take a quick look at a type certificate data sheet example. This is for um, a PA-28161 is what we care about here, where I do a lot of flight instruction. We're flying Piper Warriors. Um, again, the type certificate data sheet is a document that provides a detailed description of the design, limitations, and operational characteristics of a specific type of aircraft, engine, or propeller. It effectively serves as the official birth certificate, if you will, for the aircraft, outlining all the approved details for that particular model. Um, if we look deeper into this particular TCDS, we'll notice in here um, a note here, 11, that says you can actually fly this aircraft without the spinner dome or front and rear bulkheads uh, removed. So kind of odd, but yep, there's a, there's a situation here where you can actually fly this aircraft uh, without its spinner dome or rear or front bulkheads. Uh, what is a CAR 3 or 14 Code of Federal Regulation Part 23? So the Civil Aeronautics Board was the predecessor to the FAA. And Part 3 refers to the previous version of 14 Code of Federal Regulation Part 23, which dealt with the airworthiness of airplanes. So this is kind of an old document from, I think, around 1948. It details the requirements for certification, flight, strength, design, construction, and other operating limitations of these types of aircraft, and ensures that airplanes meet specific standards for safety and reliability before they can be operated commercially or for general aviation purposes. So if you pull up the uh, car uh, for um, a normal utility or air acrobatic aircraft, you can see, for example, in uh, some um, excerpts that we took out of here, that you can see that it requires an induction system for de-icing. Basically, carb heat uh, is required. Also noticed here, oil pressure indicator is required, fuel pressure indicator is required, and a magnetic direction indicator is required. Uh, so some of those things like a compass not working, yeah, it's a problem if it's not working in your plane. you got to have it per the car. And then comprehensive equipment list, Section 6, Weight and Balance Section of an Airplane Flight Manual or Pilot Operating Handbook. Uh, this contains a list of all the items in the aircraft that are required or not required uh, to be in the aircraft to make it airworthy. So 
in this example here, this comes right out of the uh, Piper Warrior 28161. It describes what uh, category A, B, or C is, or item A, B, or C, um, whether it's required or not. And then um, as we look through that list in just a few examples here, A, it is a denotes an item which is required. You've got to have an engine to fly the plane. B, um, it's a required item, but there could be options, like the alternator could be one of three different flavors here. Uh, you need a fuel pump. You need electric fuel pump. So uh, that's what you also want to take a look at um, in the POH to make sure there's something not um, dedicated in here that's required to fly the aircraft legally. And then last thing I want to bring up is maintenance required. So uh, maintenance requirement 91.405C, each owner or operator of an aircraft shall have any inoperative instrument or item equipment permitted to be op inoperative by 91.213, um, repaired, replaced, or removed, or placard, um, or inspected at the next required inspection. So the main point here is that um, you can potentially placard something um, and disable it um, because it's not required for flight. However, you cannot just let it um, be in perpetuity uh, non-working. At the next required inspection, you need to have it um, taken care of. All right, so that's how we assess whether or not we can fly an aircraft when we find out that we've got some piece of equipment or instrument not working the aircraft. 91.213 and part 43 are instrumental to make sure you fully understand them um, as a pilot and particularly as a student going in for a check ride so that we can properly assess whether or not we can fly that aircraft based on the scenario that we're being presented by the DPE or the scenario in the real world. Hopefully you found this video helpful, and if you did, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to this channel so you get notified on my next video.